Okay. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Dave Bowman. I am actually the Campus Food Service Director. Um, I know some of you. I don't know most of you. Every time I come and do this, which is usually just once a year, I see a lot of new faces. Um, and I just want to thank you for your service. I know your job is way more physically demanding and mentally troubling than mine. And I do appreciate what you do. Um, and I know that at the end of the day, you are looking to take care of children and to, to, to keep everyone safe and food handling and cooking and things of that nature are kind of, are kind of secondhand to you. And I do, I do appreciate what you do. Um, just know that, that, you know, handling food safely is very, very important. It is important because we serve two uh, populations of folks on this campus. We serve the very young, right? And the very old, right? So the very young are susceptible to foodborne illness because their immune systems aren't quite what they need to be yet, and the elderly because their immune systems aren't, aren't quite what they used to be, okay? You folks serve, serve the young, so you need to be very, very uh, cognizant of um, food handling and things of that nature. So this is very old, and I do apologize, but it is still relevant. I don't even remember what that person's name is anymore. Betsy. That was Betsy, does she still work for us? Okay, well, I hope whatever Betsy's doing is, is making her happy. Okay, so keys to preventing foodborne illnesses. Uh, there are four primary causes of contamination. Number one, which is the most common, is bacteria. Bacteria grow rapidly in the temperature danger zone. Who besides Kathy and the rest of the kitchen crew know what the temperature danger zone is? Nope. Well, it is, a it is just that, it is the danger zone. It is the, the um, range of temperatures where foodborne illness likes to hang out, grow, and wreak havoc, okay? It is 41 degrees Fahrenheit to 135 degrees Fahrenheit. In between that zone is where bacteria like to hang out, multiply, and wreak havoc, okay? That being said, your cold foods need to be held at 41 degrees and lower, and then your foods held for service need to be at 135 degrees or hotter. That's really what you guys worry about. You don't really worry about cooking a whole lot, right? You do cook some, but for the most part, the kitchen staff is cooking food and they're bringing it down for you, right? So, <clears throat> we're cooking chicken, okay? How hot does chicken need to be? Anyone know? What's that? Hot, right? What do you have to cook chicken to? Salmonella, right? Salmonella is nasty, right? Probably one of the most common foodborne illnesses, right? A uh, little fun fact, I don't know what, what, what you do for fun, but one in every 10,000 eggs has salmonella in it. Just one out of every, every 10,000 eggs. Every single chicken breast has salmonella hanging out on it, okay? So, how do you kill salmonella? You cook it to 165 degrees Fahrenheit for 15 seconds or more. But Dave, I thought you just said that the, the uh, temperature danger zone ended at 135 degrees, right? Right, it does. That is for holding food. You still have to cook food to the correct temperature for that food to kill the bacteria that live in that food. Okay, eggs, 140 degrees. Fish, 145 degrees. Pork, 140 degrees. Ground meats, 155. And the granddaddy of them all, the nasty one, chicken, you need to cook to 165 degrees, right? So you're gonna assume that Kathy does that, right? Kathy and Barb and Krista, they're gonna do that for you, right? Your responsibility is to make sure that once you're serving that food, during service it does not drop below 135 degrees, okay? Tonight's chicken fingers, we cook them to 165 degrees, James goes to serve them, um, fight breaks out in the unit, we're looking at starting service an hour late, okay? James goes to tempt that chicken, it is now down to 120 degrees. What does James do? Right. What, what, there's two things you can do. Yes, reheat. Reheat it to what? 165. 165 degrees for 15 seconds. Once food has dropped below the, the acceptable temperature for hot holding, you need to reheat it to 165 degrees for 15 seconds. Okay? What's your second option? You throw it away, but who's going to be mad at you? The big man Carl, right? Because at the end of the month, why are we throwing all this food away? Why are we spending so much money on food? Why do you keep buying pizza when we have in-house cooks, right? So that's basically, those are your options, all right? Is to reheat it to 165 degrees or throw it away, okay? Um, 
Who can name another foodborne illness? E. coli. E. coli. Perfect. Okay. Who knows anything about E. coli? Remember we had a big E. coli. Does anyone remember the big E. coli outbreak in the 90s? What's that? Uh, it, it, it can be lettuce, but E. coli a lot of times uh, you will find with beef cattle, okay? Funny thing about E. coli is it cooks quickly, okay? It lives on the surface of beef, so you can eat your rare steak. You can cook it off the steak real, real, real fast, right? But Kathy's serving burgers tonight. Now what? Right, why does it have to be cooked through? Because it's ground, because it's all up in there now, right? Now that E. coli, that, that surface dweller, now lives all in the burger. That's why you need to cook your burgers to 155 degrees, okay? Uh, who's ever heard of botulism? Okay, what's botulism? It is. It's, it, it, botulism is probably the most deadly foodborne illness. There is no known cure, okay? And if you ever see a bloated can, Nine and a half times out of ten, it's going to have botulism in it. What do you do with a bloated can? You throw it away. You do not open it. You do not release that into the air. Okay, botulism attacks your central nervous system. And if you are a susceptible person, like an elderly person or a child, there's a good chance that it will be terminal for you. Funny thing about botulism, here in America, we go to a doctor and they put in a syringe and we inject it into our face. You ever heard of Botox? There you go, that's botulism, only in America, because it attacks your central nervous system and it makes you relax, so your wrinkles go away, so you look pretty, right? So that's botulism. Um, so prevention of uh, foodborne illness when it comes to bacteria is you always cook potentially hazardous foods properly and you want to separate your raw and your ready-to-eat foods. We will get to cross-contamination later, um, but food, bar food service always begins with what? Washing your hands. That is the most preventative action that you can take. The best preventative action that you can take is you wash your hands. You wash your hands before you make food. You wash your hands before you put gloves on. You wash your hands after you take the gloves off. You wash your hands after you smoke. You wash your hands after you touch another human being. And especially when you go to the bathroom. Any questions on bacteria? It's fun. You can Google it. It's, it's good. Okay, so viruses, hepatitis A, B, C, well not C so much, but hepatitis A is the most well-known virus. Um, anyone remember guppies, old guppies? Back in the day, Bell's grocery store, right? Your friends would make fun of you if you went to Bell's because, oh, your whole family has hepatitis because they had a hepatitis outbreak, you know? Um, hepatitis A is um, really, really comes from the human intestinal tract, which means poop, right, right? The genesis of most foodborne illness is poop. Okay, I hate to say it. It's either someone who was picking your food, um, didn't wash their hands properly, someone who was preparing their food, didn't wash their hands properly. Okay, most of the time, foodborne illness comes from poop. Okay. Oops, sorry. Okay, parasites. Uh, there are tiny worms and bugs that live in fish and meat. Okay, it's just a natural occurrence. It's just like our human body. We've got tiny little parasites, things that are, are alive inside of you. Um, really, food handling, prevention, best way to, to take care of the little parasites is make sure you're cooking food and make sure you're getting food from a reputable supplier. Should you be buying tuna sashimi from 7-Eleven? Probably not, right? There's a reason that people pay the extra money to go to Wegmans, right? So if you see it in there, it's probably not the best place for it. Any questions on parasites? Okay. Okay, so chemicals. Uh, they, this will segue into cross-contamination, but um, chemicals need to be stored separately from food, okay? Um, you don't want to eat a bleach burger. You want to make sure that if you are handling chemicals, they are away from food, that you're using the proper PPE for handling those chemicals, and then you are washing your hands when you're, it's time for you to prepare food. Uh, you guys still allowed to use bleach over here? No, yeah, so no bleach, right? Uh, there's a funny thing about bleach, and I kind of go over this every time I do this, and for those of you that have been here, um, I asked a chemical supply guy to ask me why we can't use bleach, and it has something to do with the fact that the temperature you need to keep bleach at to make it an effective sanitizer also 
kills its effectiveness. So it's a very strange thing, but just don't use bleach. No more bleach. Okay, cross-contamination. Um, who knows anything about cross-contamination? Who can give me an example? Cutting up chicken and then throw some uh, carrots on it and start chopping up. Exactly, exactly. You can go carrots first and then chicken, right? Even though you really, you know, you want to make sure that you're in the habit of, of changing your cutting board, your gloves, your knife, sanitizing everything in between. Anytime you, anything that's not ready to eat, you need to make sure that you are using separate utensils and separate um, cutting boards, things like that. Um, another big thing this day and age now is food allergies, right? A lot more food allergies than I'm 40 years old. Anyone that's 40 or older, you didn't really hear about food allergies growing up, right? Once in a while, a kid would be allergic to peanuts, right? Now it seems like food allergies are very, very prevalent. You know, you've got um, your top eight. Um, can anyone name the top eight allergens or one of them? What's that? Peanuts. Peanuts. Fish. Fish and shellfish, right? Dairy. Dairy. Eggs. Eggs. Gluten or wheat. Soy. Soy. Tree nuts, because tree nuts and peanuts are different. Everyone knows that, right? A peanut is not a nut. And we miss one. Fish. Shellfish. No, fish shelf. We got all eight. We got all eight. Okay. Um, that's a big concern. Okay. Um, I don't know what it is um, about the way that food is prepared or processed these days, but food born, or food allergies are a lot more prevalent. So you need to make sure that you're aware of that. Um, do you have any students now that have food allergies? Mm -hmm. So what do we do? Make them something different to eat. You keep, keep the food separate. Use a separate cutting board, right? If you have someone with a gluten allergy, you need to make sure that you get a separate toaster. They're, they're real cheap. You can get them for like five, six bucks, okay? Um, worst thing you want is next to foodborne illness is an anaphylactic shock, right? I mean, I, I would want to use an EpiPen on someone. I don't feel comfortable with that. Um, you might want to look at investing in separate utensils. Who knows what the universal color for food allergy is? Purple. So they sell little purple kits now. They have everything in there. They have um, cutting boards and knives and tongs and things like that. So universal color for food allergy is purple. Um, so big thing with cross-contamination, like I said, is just make sure that you are changing your gloves, you are washing your hands, and you are aware of what you're doing and that you are aware of people with their food allergies. Okay, so tips for accurate temperature readings. You guys all have food temperatures, right? right? We all have the therm thermometers, right? Bimetallic stem thermometer, digital, or with a dial. Okay, everyone knows how to use that. There's a little dimple in your thermometer that you gotta make sure that you're getting the food at least to that dimple so you can get a correct reading. How do you do that with a thin four ounce hamburger? How do you take the temperature of a four ounce hamburger? Does anyone know? What's that? What if it's too thin? You stack three, four on top of each other, right? And then you will get an accurate reading. Do not try and stick a thermometer in a skinny little hamburger. It's not gonna work. It's not gonna be accurate. If you were roasting a turkey, okay? Do you keep taking the temperature in the same spot? No. No, right? Once you have pierced the skin, you pierced the flesh, the accurate, the, that's going to be one accurate reading. That's it. Okay? So if you have to take, if you're at Thanksgiving time and you're cooking a big 20 pound turkey and you need to take the temperature a few different times, you need to make sure that you're taking that temperature in different places. Because once you've, once you've put a hole in that meat, the accurate reading is that you get that one accurate reading, and then after that, it's not going to be accurate anymore. Okay? Um, once again, the temperature danger zone is 41 degrees to 135 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, any questions so far? Okay. So, these are serve safe recommended temperatures for food. Um, your roasts, your steaks, your chops are 145 degrees. Seafood is 145 degrees. Anything ground is going to be 155. And then your big one, your poultry, your turkey, your chicken, and your duck are 165 degrees. Okay, common food handler mistakes. Um, 
not controlling coughs and sneezes around food. If someone is ill, they are not to pre be preparing food that day, okay? If someone is throwing up, they are not to be anywhere near the food service, okay? Over at the home, if someone throws up, they go home regardless if it's morning sickness, um, a hangover, or they truly are sick. Why do we do that? Because you are now creating an infection control problem, okay? Because someone has just um, defecated through their mouth onto a preparation area. So if, you, if you're sick that day and it's your turn to serve, you need to tap out and let someone else do it, okay? Uh, improper labeling and dating. We even struggle with it. Like I know food service to you folks is secondary. You have more important things to do. Uh, food labeling and dating is confusing to even myself because there are different rules and they change all the time. Like I said before, if you have a question, you go to Kathy, you go to one of her crew. If there's something that's not dated, just err on the side of caution and throw it away, okay? Um, and in, when you are sanitizing, you need to have a sanitizer bucket and you need to have a soap bucket, okay? And then that sanitizer needs to be changed how often? Once every two hours. Once every two hours. Every hour is good. Every two hours is, is acceptable. Um, you're using a multi-quat. So every two hours, every hour is, is great if you can do it, but every two hours would be acceptable. And your rag for your sanitizer stays in your sanitizer bucket until you use it. Your, your rag for your soap stays in your soap and you don't switch them over because soap will decrease the effectiveness of sanitizer. And when you have spills, you need to make sure that you clean them up right away. Um, outdoor food, um, food that is held for outdoor use. And you guys do cookouts throughout the summer, right? Really, need, time is an enemy to food, okay? So even if you have it packed in a cooler, you need to be aware that you need to serve it as soon as you, as you possibly can. You don't want to go do your activity, you know, and then leave your food for last. Dehydration, stay hydrated. I don't know why this is in here, and I always tell myself I'm going to take it out, but hydration is very important. Okay, let's take a quiz. Okay, in order to be sure potentially hazard food, hazardous food is free from harmful bacteria, you need to what? A, cook it to the proper temperature, cook it until it's done, cook it until it steams, or cook it until the juice is run clear. That would be A, correct. The proper and safe temperature for cooking chopsticks and roasts is? B, correct. To avoid contamination of food from a virus, it is important to A, cook all foods to proper temperatures, B, wash hands properly before handling food, keep frozen foods at zero degrees or lower, store chemicals in an area separate from food. What do you got? Yes, B, B. Viruses, washing hands. Okay, washing hands properly when changing food, handling tasks, and after using the restroom should take at least. Happy birthday song, which is about 20 seconds long. Okay, so proper hand washing is what? Okay, a lot of times um, we have automatic sinks now, uh, which are best. Put your hands under the water, hot as you can handle, 110, 120 degrees. Get your hands wet so they absorb the soap. You soap up, you sing the song in your head, you rinse, and then you dry either with a, with a one-use towels are best. Air dryers are still acceptable, even though there's a lot of research that just show that they just absorb poop and just put it back in the atmosphere. But single-use towels are best. What's that? Then you grab the dirty door handle and you walk out. Okay, so hand sanitizer and soap and water are the same thing, right? Absolutely not. There is no replacement for just good old fashioned hand washing, okay? Hand sanitizer is a supplement to, it's not a replacement for proper hand washing, okay? There really is no known effect that alcohol has on hands. I think it's more of a myth and it just makes people feel better, but that's a conversation for another time. Just wash your hands. You cannot wash your hands enough, especially when it comes to food service. So, 20 seconds. I think that's it. Okay, that's it. Any questions?
Thank you folks for having me. Um, 